There's a foreign interest group called APAC that's, you know, got the ear of this current speaker and demanded 16 votes in April on on Israel or the Middle East. We haven't had 16 votes in April on the United States. So what's APAC? APAC is the American Israel Public Affairs Committee. And um, they didn't start out as a PAC in, in the sense of a political action committee, but now they have a political action committee. Um, ostensibly, it's a group of Americans who lobby on behalf of Israel. They're for anything Israel. Um, and they're a very effective lobbying group. To understand APAC, I think it's easiest to model them as a uh, military industrial lobby. Like their biggest thing is they want more equipment, more military equipment from the United States going to Israel. In fact, when they w used to be allowed in my office, the thing they, the argument they would make is, oh, we're just stimulating the U.S. military industrial complex because every single penny of the three point eight billion that they nominally get. Now they're getting way more than that. But that Israel nominally gets goes to U.S. military contractors. Israel is creating tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of, of people who are going to hate the United States and, and, you know, they're going to hate Israel also, but because we're giving Israel the weapons to do what they're doing, we're creating a lot of people who hate us in this country. But we're told that it's essential to our national security to do that. Do you believe that? No, I don't see that. I mean, one of, one of the reasons, like I said, the Biden letter said, well, we need to keep our industrial base strong. So let's fund all these weapons and send them over. But I don't see how it's strengthening our country. In fact, we're getting weaker by doing it because at that point they sensed I wouldn't do what they wanted. When but I got what the did they whisper against you? What were they saying about you? Um, well, they would do it through, for instance, churches, evangelical churches. They've got an organization called Christians United for Israel, where they sort of co-opted evangelicals. Uh, people think it's a grassroots movement in Kentucky. It's actually a top-down movement from APAC so that people who aren't even Jewish will feel like they've got to support Israel, you know, no matter what. And even if it's a secular state that funds abortions, they, you know, just sort of forget that part and we've got to fund Israel. So they have networks. So it's more than just about the money. They try to get me to write a white paper as a candidate, for instance, for Congress. On what? On Israel. And I wouldn't do it. And they said, why? And I'm like, I don't do homework for lobbyists, right? I'm like, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't like writing term papers at college. I'm not writing one for you. <laughs> what did they say? They said, oh, well, here, just copy Rand Paul's term paper and put your name on it. We'll accept that. And I'm like, no, I'm still not. <laughs> I mean, you're laughing, but you know what? I bet uh, I may be the only Republican in Congress who hasn't done homework for APAC. And it's just what it is. It's conditioning. They want you to do something very simple and benign and, you know, for them. They don't really they don't really grade your term paper. They just want to know that you'll do something for them. And if you'll do something for them as a candidate, you're more likely to do something for them as as a congressman when you get in there. You're probably the only Republican in the House who hasn't done homework for them, who isn't on their side. And that's OK. I mean, you can have, you know, you're a libertarian oriented right. Republican from northern Kentucky. Why do they care? Why not just let Thomas Massey be Thomas Massey in northern Kentucky? Like, why why the need to crush you? I don't know. I think it's they don't want one horse out of the barn. If one person starts speaking the truth, they're afraid it could be contagious, perhaps. So you've been, um, I think, the lone Republican to dissent from a lot of these votes. Can you, like, how many votes have there been oh my on this question and where have you voted on them? Last month, we voted like 15 or 16 times on issues related to Israel. And, you know, I've been hit because I voted no on all of those. Why do you, because you hate Israel or is there another reason? Let me just put a little footnote here. I'm not against Israel. I've never voted to sanction Israel. I've never said anything particularly, you know, critical of Israel, uh, you know, uh, other than, for instance, right now they're bombing. They've killed 1% of the civilian population in Gaza. That's concerning to me. I'm against uh, sending our money overseas. I'm against starting another proxy war. I'm against sanctions because it's going to weaken the dollar. Uh, I'm for free speech. Like all of these resolutions run afoul of those things. And that's why I can't vote for them. Tell us what the free speech part of it. So recently they brought a bill to Congress 
And this was actually a binding bill, not a non-binding resolution. Like right. this was going to have the effect of law and people would get, you know, prosecuted if they um, engaged in anti-Semitism on campuses. And the problem with this bill is they use some international definition of anti-Semitism on a website somewhere. My first question is, why don't you just put the definition in the bill? Why are you pointing to somebody's URL in a, a piece of legislation? So I went to this website and it's got a, you know, fairly short definition, but it's also got examples of things that would be considered anti-Semitism. And some of these are actually passages in the New Testament, if you will, would be banned by this international definition of anti-Semitism. For instance, saying that uh, Jews killed Jesus, which is, you know, in the Bible, he was he was not welcome among his own people. OK, um, it, and so that would be anti-Semitism. And if you engaged in that on campus or just offered that as a thought, let's say in a classroom, you would be anti-Semitic and you would run afoul of the Department of Education and some federal laws. And, you know, there were other examples in there that were hard to believe. For instance, comparing the policies of Israel to, to the Nazi regime would be anti-Semitic. But the question is, what if, their, what if their policies ever became the same? Is this a static definition? My constituents aren't falling for it. Two weeks ago, I just had a primary and got 76% of the vote with APAC running hundreds of thousands of dollars of ads. They've spent you know millions of dollars against you over the years and it has had no effect. You get reelected in the primary in the 70s. So like, why are they still spending against you in, in your state, statewide? Well, uh, they say that they don't want me to run statewide. They're worried that I'll run for McConnell's seat. And so they're trying to send me a message. That's what they would tell you. I've never said that I'm running for the Senate, right? Yeah. I, I'm pretty much disinterested in it personally and publicly. But just in case they're running ads statewide. Now, mind you, there are six congressional districts in Kentucky, and I only represent one of them. They're running the ads in all six congressional districts just in case this election cycle they spent four hundred thousand dollars against me ninety thousand dollars last fall running tv ads in my district and facebook ads and whatnot even though my election is over they're still running hundreds of thousand dollars of negative ads. so it's it's not working against me i i think it's short-sighted uh on their you know on their side to do this they're just burning money but they're trying to make an example of me but they're I, also exposing their weakness I think they are. I think they've exposed a real weakness here. And, you know, it used to be just me voting against some of these resolutions. But recently where they tried to ban passages in the New Testament, I think we got like almost two dozen Republicans who said, wait, hold on there. Well, I have Republicans who come to me on the floor and say, I wish I could vote with you today. Yours is the right vote, but I would just take too much flack back home. And I have republicans who come to me and say that's wrong what apac is doing to you let me talk to my apac person by the way everybody but me has an apac person what like, does that mean an apac person it's like your babysitter your apac babysitter who uh is always talking to you for apac they're probably a constituent in your district but they are you know firmly embedded in apac and every member has something like this Every I don't know how it works on the Democrat side, uh, but that's how it works on the Republican side. And when they and when they come to D.C., you go have lunch with them and they've got your cell number and you have conversations with them. So I've had like that's cr absolutely crazy. I've had four members of Congress say, I'll talk to my APAC person. And it's literally what we call them, my APAC guy. <laughs> I'll talk to my APAC guy and see if I can get him to, you know, dial those ads back. Why have I never heard this before? It doesn't benefit anybody. Why would they want to tell their constituents that they've basically got a buddy system with somebody who's representing a foreign country? It doesn't benefit the congressman for people to know that. So they're not going to tell you that. Does anyone have a Putin guy that they talk to? Yeah. Not only do they not have a Putin guy, <laughs> look, they don't they, they don't have a Britain guy. They don't have an Australian guy. They you know, they don't have a Germany dude. Like it's the only country that does this that has somebody that like uniformly I guarantee there's some spreadsheet at APAC where 
<laughs> where you know the the APAC dude is who's matched up with the congressman is there, and then all the congressman's votes on the issue. Oh, has the congressman been to Israel? They they pay for trips for congressmen and their spouses to go to Israel. I may be, I mean, I don't. I, I'm not the only Republican who hasn't taken the APAC trip to Israel. But I'm probably one of a dozen that hasn't taken that trip. And the other ones just haven't got around to it. And so the Biden administration has put a bunch of people in jail for violating something called FARA, the Foreign Agent Registration Act, 1936-ish. It's been on the books for, you know, 90 years. Um, and it's never been enforced ever until recently, until really the Trump era and Biden era. So, but the law requires people who lobby on behalf of foreign governments to register. It's that simple. And this is the largest lobby in the United, most effective lobby in the United States on behalf of a foreign government. Are they registered with FARA? They are not, but they should be. Well, how how can that how can that be? How can they put Paul Manafort in jail, which they did on a FARA violation, and a bunch of other people in jail on FARA violations? But the largest and most effective and most feared foreign lobby working for a foreign government doesn't have to register under the law. That's insane. FARA applies not to f foreigners, to foreign agents right. Right? It's, of foreign it's, principles, agents of foreign principles. It's Americans lobbying on behalf of foreign governments. Correct. So this is, APAC is exactly what FARA is meant for. Now they would say, and we have a First Amendment right. Okay, well, I agree, I, I agree with you there, but we also have election laws. And to the it's disclosure, right? We're, they're not, FARA doesn't say you can't say Thomas Massey's, you know, an ignorant hillbilly, you're allowed to say that if you want to, but we just want to check where your money's coming from. Tell us where it's coming from, what you're spending it on, and if you are lobbying on behalf of a foreign country. So they should be, now to your point, they should be registered with FARA. This is what FARA is, is where there's gray area, right. where it's an American representing a foreign country. Yes. Let's let's look and see if you're getting any money from that foreign country. Are you a dual citizen with that foreign country? Uh, are you being directed by, for instance, is Netanyahu speaking to your group, advising you on your next move? Those are you getting money from the military industrial complex? Yeah. Like th they would, I think, be okay with a war with Iran, like an all out, you know, apocalyptic war with Iran. Whereas there are people in Israel say, whoa, hold on a second. We'd, we'd rather not have a war with Iran, but APAC does things that lead us in that direction. And so they're kind of like, what the NRA is to gun owners, APAC right. is to Israel, or what the Farm Bureau is to farmers, APAC is to Israel. In other represents words, represents a faction, right? They represent a faction, but usually a corporate faction. That uh, and they're using the imprimatur of grassroots that they've diluted or confused into bullying congressmen. And the NRA does that, and Farm Bureau does that. I'm I'm picking on some you know other right wing groups here. You may have come to the obvious conclusion that the real debate is not between Republican and Democrat or socialist and capitalist, right, left. The real battle is between people who are lying on purpose and people who are trying to tell you the truth.